So this is our Healthy Homes Initiative. It's a certification that we have for some of our um, in-network builders. Uh, it's also tied in with these two or three pilots that were mentioned. We're doing one with NBRH in St. Johnsbury, one with Springfield Hospital, and we're getting ready to start another one at UVM. But this is sort of the Healthy Home presentation, sort of an overview of Healthy Homes and uh, the sort of program that we're, we're in the process of rolling out. Um, so once again, uh, a lot of this has to do with really indoor air quality and what people are, uh, I guess, does anyone have any sort of idea what sort of the average amount of time people spend in buildings, either their homes or their schools or their places of work? Is anybody per willing? Day or per well, just as a percentage of total time. Yeah. Inside time. Yeah, inside time. Yeah. A lot. A lot. Hours a day. <laughs> yeah. So from a from if you a person. live in northern Vermont. <laughs> yeah. Well, though in the summertime, people get outside a lot. It seems like. So maybe it's, there's a. So, so the average is about ninety percent of the time people are in houses, right? And so people are starting to make the connection between uh, health and their living environments, and so that's sort of what's going on with this um, presentation. So this is sort of the agenda, you know, is there a problem? And I think we all sort of admit that there is a problem um, looking at where trends are going with health and uh, the way buildings are sort of advancing. Um, we'll talk about the house itself as it works as a system. There are sort of eight principles of this healthy home program and we'll go over those. And then we'll sort of talk about how efficiency and health sort of actually go hand in hand, surprisingly enough. Um, and sort of how Efficiency Vermont can help you get uh, more information about this and sort of how we can get this out there and make people more aware of it and bring it into um, the public's interest. So is there a problem? We sort of talk about that. Um, so I guess one of the questions we often ask, do, does anybody have sort of any ideas about what some of the sort of hazards are as far as health in their homes? And uh, we, we certainly can talk about different things that people might question whether it is or not. Um, radon. Yeah, radon's a good one. Yeah, okay. we're, we're gonna. What was that? Outgassing from insulation, foams, upholstery. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. A lot of those are uh, formaldehyde-based products. Yeah. yeah, certainly. Yeah. Carbon monoxide. Yeah, yeah. In a big way, as we tighten houses up. Yeah. And we're gonna sort of touch upon these. That you, you guys are sort of hitting all the. The major ones. There's a couple more in here. Lead, maybe people would certainly oh, yeah. talk about. We'll talk about lead a little bit. Yes, asbestos is a big one. Um, yeah. So I guess we'll move ahead. Everybody has a pretty good idea of what we're. So here's lead, right? Anything pre 1978 probably is lead. EPA came on board and said, okay, um, this is a dangerous product. That we is anybody um, lead certified? There's a certification that EPA has for uh, builders. It's a pretty extensive certification. Um, for removal? For, yeah, yeah. yeah, for really lead removal, yeah. It's a very specialized thing. Um, it turns out that 70% of the housing stock in the state of Vermont was built prior to 78. So it certainly is a concern. Um, it's interesting because we, it's, it's a, like a two day training. Um, and when this first happened, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago, there was a rush for everybody to, so a bunch of my colleagues, they put together like a one day training crash for us to get in there and get an idea of what was going on. And we started looking at some of the specs and you have to like plastic everything and you have to have, you know, cleaning, a booze coming and going. And uh, one of the things it says, you know, they allow you to remove, they allow you to disturb like, you know, 12 square inches or something. And I went to one of my, I said, you know, that's about the same size as a bath fan. And I would imagine that that's probably, you know, you'll allow a plumber or someone to come in and cut a hole that big, right? And I said, isn't that funny? Because that's about the same size of a bath fan. And it's probably a practical number behind all that. But it's a very uh, detailed thing. And with lead, it's the dust and it's the chips. Um, certainly children uh, have uh, disorders, uh, cognitive problems, that sort of stuff. So it's a very serious problem. Um, and someone mentioned asbestos, right? And so this actually is a product called vermiculite, which is a very common insulation for a long period of time. The majority of this stuff uh, came out of uh, a mine in Libby, Montana. 
And typically what happens is if people run into asbestos, it, it, typically you, you assume that, or if you run into vermiculite, you assume that it has asbestos in it because the majority of vermiculite has asbestos in it. And once again, asbestos is associated with lung cancer and asbestosis, that sort of stuff. It has to do with the particle. It has a certain shape that gets lodged in the lungs. <clears throat> I guess the one good thing about it is it typically takes a lot of long exposure to this where you sort of get into trouble with um, that sort of, yeah. Is it the same vermiculite that has always been added to soil? No, that, there's an agricultural oh. product of vermiculite, yeah. Most of the stuff that's in insulation, and there's actually a documentary called Libby, and now if you ever are, you know, looking to get really worried, watch that documentation. So we certainly see a lot of this product in Vermont, um, and so it can be, uh, and then theoretically you're not supposed to disturb it. So, um, and if you are going to abate it, then it has to be done by professionals. Um, and it's interesting, some of the time, we actually have a loan product now called this Heat Saver Loan. And one of the things that's often been difficult with loan products that address energy efficiency is you can't necessarily use them for health and safety. You can only use them for like insulation. And this product that we have put together, this loan product, will allow you to use up to 50% of that product for the abatement of these sort of things. So there is some room to move ahead. Yeah. In, in the 70s, as part of our industrial arts class, we took a field trip to the asbestos mine in Lowell. Yeah. And we were right there in the room where they packaged the asbestos and were, you know, processing it and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Probably wouldn't do that today. Yeah, <laughs> right. A bunch of kids. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the processor. Right, yeah. Um, so if you have an attic with vermiculite in it, you assume it has asbestos, and then would you not add insulation on top of that? Like, would right, you yeah. either do nothing or well, you get rid of it, or would you recommend getting rid of it? Well, I, I know like the weatherization crews, they, they just sort of move away from it. They don't fool with it, right? Unless there's a serious abatement and then that's a whole different process. So oftentimes in houses that have that product, you work in areas where that product, oftentimes you see this in flat attic spaces where they blow in or they pour it in. Sometimes you find it in the walls. So it's not uncommon in situations like that to just sort of have to leave that alone and work in areas, maybe in foundations or rim joists or air sealing and insulating in areas where you're not going to disturb this. And it's okay to just leave it there from a safety point of view? I think as long as it doesn't get disturbed, right, then it's, and that's a pretty common thing even with a lot of asbestos products is that oftentimes they'll either encapsulate it, 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 it can actually cause more trouble if you try and tear it apart and carry it out of the building. It's and, when it's airborne. Right, it's actually, exactly, it's yeah, yeah. And there are some other products, and we're going to see those, I think, just, yeah. So especially, this is pipe insulation. Um, in Barrie, when we look at a lot of these old steam uh, heating systems, mm -hmm. we still see this from time to time. And so, uh, and that, once again, is it. And it's also using um, floor tiles, some adhesives, uh, some siding is actually asbestos siding, brake lining. I mean, for what the product was supposed to do, it really did work well as far as dissipating heat. I mean, they made brake pads out of it and all kinds of My wife's uh, her, uh, father was an airline mechanic at LaGuardia, and he would go, oh, yeah, we heard all about, you know, all the great brake park, and then they did away with it, and boy, wasn't that too bad, and, you know, well, it really wasn't too bad. Cause, uh, um, so th that's where you're going to find the asbestos products. Um, so someone mentioned radon, and sure enough, uh, uh, moderate potential, that's sort of the color that the majority of Vermont is, and even the low potential can sort of have it. Um, so it's one of those things you don't know unless you test. Um, I think three out of ten houses in the state of Vermont supposedly have radon problems. Um, and as it turns out, I brought a little radon test with me. I'll hand that around. On this pilot that we're doing in St. Johnsbury, what we're trying to do is, here, I'll let you take it. So that's a product. What you do is you open that little package up and you hang it in the lowest sort of living area where you are um, occupying. And then you leave it for a minimum of three days, up to seven days, and then you have to quickly mail it into the lab and they do the analysis. And they I measure, what's that? I have, I'm getting ready to send it back. It's this little thing that I yeah. have to leave. From the state? For yeah. like a yes. year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, another. Why do they do that? <laughs> What's that? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I came from out of state, but I, I couldn't understand why to leave it for a year. You're living with it the whole year. Well, there's, th that's more of a long-term test. Typically what happens with this, this is a quicker test. And so if you get a positive result, then you test again and make sure that, you know. So the test that you're talking about, that long-term one, did that come from the state? Yeah. Is that the, yeah, yeah. That yeah. probably is a better result, but this is sort of the down and dirty, let's see what's going on. And, uh, and so once again, if it turns out that you have high, I just put one of those in my basement the other day, and uh, you're looking for a rating of four or less, and mine came back at 7.9. So um, I'm getting ready to hang another one and put another one in the house upstairs um, because we don't really spend a lot of time in the basement. So if it turns out the one up in the living room comes in at 2.8 or something, then I'll sleep easier, you know, but we'll see. And once again, that's something that needs to be professionally mitigated. Um, typically what they do, uh, it's coming from the soil um, and it comes up through cracks and nooks or crannies or up through the concrete slab or through the dirt floor. And so oftentimes the remedy to that is they'll drill a hole into the slab and then they'll put a fan and then they'll suck air out from under the slab out through this fan to the outside. And sometimes even in new construction, because you're really not going to know until you test. And in new construction, it's not uncommon for us to say, hey, take a, before you pour your slab, you know, take a uh, five gallon joint compound bucket and put it in the way of the concrete and then you'll have the sump and uh, where you can run some piping somewhere in anticipation of this. So it's not like you have to spend a lot of money for the fans and the metering, but at least when, if you get to that point when the house is done and do the test, then at least you'll have most of the work ready to plug in the mechanics to uh, alleviate the radon problem. And you put the, um, the five gallon bucket in the concrete? Well, what you're trying to do... and the fan pulling it out. Yeah, what underneath. you're trying to do is leave a void in that slab so that you can put a fan connected to that void. Because so I've say, had, it, I've had yeah. it done in houses in, in Maryland, and they put the, the piping under the um, concrete slab yeah, yeah. and run it right up. It yeah. costs about 1200 bucks. Yeah. And you retest, and it comes way down. Yeah. Um, but I, I wouldn't see. I so mean, what, it's a solid concrete slab. Well, what you're trying to do is get it. underneath the slab because yeah. the, the, so if you can put a void in the slab so that that fan will hitch to that hole, that will cause a negative pressure <laughs> underneath that slab. Any gas that's coming through that will be sucked up by that fan and exited out the building. And that's okay. just the procedure that they use in this neck of the woods. Okay, so, I got um, it. Yeah. So the fan has to be on all the time? Or yeah. is this a temporary thing? No, this the fan would run. It's a very mild, oh, small, yeah, yeah. Huh. yeah. What was this test again? Three out of how many? How many times have three done? What, what the, the, I think they're saying three out of 10. Yeah, yeah. And that's sort of just the ballpark. Um, number but isn't it doesn't the radon come from decomposing granite uh well it's uranium in the granite yeah yep the other thing is sometimes if you have a high concentration you actually test your water as well but that would happen sort of afterwards mm -hmm. because the wells if you're drilling through um once you hit bedrock right and you're drilling down into the oops sorry oh. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Ooh, things really look like that. <laughs> Is that possible? That's where I live in Peachum. <laughs> That's Peachum. <laughs> South Peachum. You can tell it's warmer down there. No. <laughs> Um, so the other thing is uh, combustion equipment, right? And so we're really talking about carbon monoxide. Somebody mentioned that, um, and particulate matter, which is small particles of dust or soot that are in the air. Um, and it's important to make sure the gaskets on the doors are good, um, that the stove pipes are all connected well. Um, it's important if you can burn good dry firewood. Um, so all those things sort of add to, it's important to have carbon monoxide detectors. New construction requires it. When houses sell, they require it. So um, carbon monoxide detectors are a really good uh, thing to have as well. Um, I'm assuming that people in here burn wood, some of you, right? That's true. Yeah. Okay. You're so done with it. 
<laughs> Nothing like backing up to a wood stove though when it's cold. Yeah. So here is a sort of list of particulate matters and sort of fireplaces way up at 28. Um, the old clunky wood stoves, which I have one, but it's, you know, 4.6 as particulate matter. As you get down into the EPA certified stoves, 1.4, pellet stoves, 0.49, sort of oil furnaces way down there at 13 one hundredths, and then gas furnaces way, way down there at, you know, 83 one thousandths. Um, and the pellet boilers are about 0 0.032. So that's sort of the particulate matter associated with those. Uh, is that pro is propane there? Uh, well, they're talking about gas furnaces, so that would either be natural gas or propane. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's more to come, right? <clears throat> and this is sort of the stuff that people um, are just starting to learn about. So this is a research study that was done on umbilical cord blood. Typically, people thought that the mother would filter the sort of chemicals that were happening. Um, and it turns out when they did this study, um, and this would have been by um, Red Cross, uh, did some of this. Um, and it turns out there's over 280 industrial chemicals in the blood samples taken from these oh. infants. Um, so we're not trying to make you alarm, but it's, uh, it's a con um, the environment has a lot of these um, things in there. So this is one study that was done. Um, Here's another study. Now, this study had to do with indoor air quality, really carbon dioxide, CO2. And actually, I have a little monitor over there that I'm running right now that's measuring the carbon dioxide and the, you know, you breathe in air and you exhaust out carbon dioxide. Um, and so this is a, a study that was done where they were uh, like sort of good, better, and best uh, environmental uh, situations in this office complex. Um, and what they found was when uh, levels of carbon dioxide were low, people scored much higher cognitively. Um, you, you know, what happens, even at our work in Burlington occasionally, we have a big meeting with a lot of people in a room. And as you get towards the end of the meeting, you're like everybody's sort of nodding off and sort of dazed. And it's because this, the carbon dioxide levels are going really, really high. And they sort of, the threshold is a thousand parts per million. And I think that when, when I first came in here, I think we were at like 780 in here. So it will be interesting as this is a pretty good sized room and I don't know how airtight, I mean it's well constructed of course in you know Craftsbury but um, we'll have to see what that number reads. So they did a, the comparison between these three studies and so I think the sort of takeaway there is if you have to take an exam or you really want you know go to a job interview go early in the morning when there's certainly a lot of oxygen in these buildings. Yeah, or open the windows, exactly, yeah. So this was a study that was done with indoor house, common household chemicals, right? And what they were looking at was kids in homes that either had done recent painting or upgrades and then kids in homes where they hadn't done that sort of stuff. And what they saw was with those chemicals in paints and varnishes and VOCs that um, some of the, the children had a higher rates of asthmas and eczemas and certain conditions as well. So these studies have been going on for a while. Um, this is a study that was uh, done uh, uh, with firefighters in Massachusetts and they're just in, during these fires they're exposed to more carcinogens and lo and behold they have higher rates of cancer. And so uh, this is sort of a no-brainer but um, some of these, you know, this is the science that backs up the concern. Um, and this is something, uh, consumer chemicals in indoor dust, right? So they went and took dust samples and they found a lot of certain things. And I know this is hard to read, but like a lot of the, you were mentioning the foam products, um, formaldehyde based stuff, urethane based stuff, a lot of, um, uh, uh, like people who do the scented candles and that sort of stuff. There's our, our um, dryer sheets or any of those products that have sort of added um, odor uh, enhancers, right? Even things like detergents. And yeah, absolutely, yeah. I know when we, sometimes we travel down the interstate and when you go through Massachusetts where Yankee Candle is, right? Yeah. Um, I say, oh, is that Yankee Candle? And so we, we call it Stinky Candle. But it, so all those chemicals really do have an effect upon you. Um, one of the things that we, and maybe there's a slide in here about is, is when we talk to people and people say, you know, I love that about my, and we say, well, you know, what happens is you sort of get sensitized to it. 
And so we try to convince, we say, hey, listen, just try it for a week, right? Try it without it for a week. And oftentimes people sort of become unsensitized, undesensitized, whatever. And, and then, you know, the hope is that they'll, 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 they'll not be so used to those um, odor causing chemicals because there's an effect from it. What about those pans that are up there? What kind of pans? Well, those, the Teflon coated pans, is yeah. that, yeah, the non-stick. Yeah, those aren't e good for you either. It's hard to, find, to, yeah. to know whether you've got Teflon anymore or not. Yeah, well, you know, the, in, in, historically, I remember some Teflon pans that came through our kitchen. And, you know, lo and behold, after they were there for a while, they started to wear away. Yeah, and I was yeah. always curious where that <laughs> went to, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a saying, you know, I go over to Burlington and my colleagues, it turns out like I'm like one of the oldest guys over there strangely enough. Um, and I always was told, listen, if you can eat like your grandparents, right, then that's a good thing. So when I go over there, I said that one day and I said, well, never mind. I said, eat like your great grandparents because <laughs> your grandparents are more like, you know, my age. So, um, and so it, cooking is sort of, the, I mean, cast iron prime pans have been around for a long time. Um, and so uh, after they're seasoned, they, they tend to work pretty well. Um, so that's an alternative to the sort of coated ones. If anybody has to chime or has an experience that they want to chime in, please, you know, don't let me just keep yakking on here. We have a ceramic pan now, yeah. which we, which we have started using in the last couple of years. That um, it's a very smooth coating, and I don't. Yeah. I, yeah, it's it's some kind of ceramic. Uh, and yeah. It seems to not. There's nothing Go to away. wear off. Yeah. Like there is with the non-stick pans, and stuff doesn't. You know, the blueberry pancakes will stick to it a little bit, but yeah. most stuff is, is pretty omelets, um, you know, things like that. Yeah. Are yeah. Ooh, eggs are the ultimate test. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, if you put enough olive oil in there, <laughs> yeah, right, right nothing exactly. will stick. So, right. Yeah. And that's supposed to be good for you, right? The, your, the Mediterranean diet is good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I heard the other day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to know. Do you yes, know I do. About yes. olive oil? The camera's uh, running. Um, well, that a lot of food we buy is actually got other stuff that's not what we th like. If you buy oregano, um, it actually might have um, olive leaves, olive tree leaves in it chopped up as part of the mixture. And olive tree leaves are full of insecticides. Well, what about the olives then? You know, all yeah. this time we've been yeah. eating olives and olive oil. Well, so anyway. Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. there's this thing called the dirty dozen, right? And it's like the products that are like the worst. And a lot of those are products that are like hang from a tree, right? Because they get covered with this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. but, um, so the link between homes and health, right? And Florence Nightingale, right? Uh, the connection between health and dwelling is one of the most important that exists. So that's sort of that's not new news because Florence Nightingale, you know, is isn't a current. Uh, even older than us. Yeah, even older than us. Thank you. Um, yeah. So who's at most risk? And this is sort of the, the thing we always see, children and seniors and low-income families. And so children certainly because they're developing and they're being exposed to this stuff. And they're at the beginning, right? They have a long haul ahead of them. What's the accumulative effect going to be on someone who's only a little, you know, toddler at this point? Um, and seniors, because oftentimes they're like, they're sort of worn out, right? And certain things don't work as well as they have in the past. Um, and the low income people typically is because they're living in substandard housing. And so they're being exposed to a lot of the things that we just talked about. So those are the people who are in the worst in the way. Um, and so these are just sort of conditions and potential. This um, PowerPoint presentation will be available to you guys. I shipped it to you. So I, it's kind of hard to read this. I'm sorry. But this just is sort of like on the left, one of the columns says allergies, asthmas, and sinus infections. That would be sort of the um, health condition and the source of the condition could be excessive relative humidity, moisture from condensation, plumbing leaks, poor site drainage, that sort of deal. And how do we fix that? Well, we do some air sealing and insulating and we go at the drainage problems. So that's just sort of the symptom, the cause, and the remedy. Um, so. So we talked earlier about the house as a system, right? And oftentimes this is a scenario that um, there's sort of three things about houses that we need to be, the, the movement of air, the movement of heat, 
and the movement of moisture. And so those are the sort of main things that if you can sort of get a handle on that, you can get an understanding of how the whole house sort of moves um, as a system. And so this is sort of saying, um, you know, you could have like three sweaters on outside, but if the wind's blowing, right, are you still going to be warm? And so they're saying, so the sweaters would be sort of the insulation and then sort of to say, um, but if you have a thin jacket to keep out the wind um, and you still have moisture, and then so with the jacket and then you add the insulation and now we're still have this the idea of what's the moisture uh, challenge and so once again there's the damp little dog who you know so we sort of have to address those three things um, so in, in a perfect world right we're we're airtight which addresses the um, air movement were insulated so houses lose uh, heat in a couple ways through conduction and through convection and conduction is through a solid and convection is through the movement of air and so um, once we take care of those and we keep things dry then we're on track um, and so here's an example of an area where and you can uh, my sense is that's an attic catch and maybe people can sort of imagine that um, there's probably not much insulation up around that attic hatch and it could very well be that that attic hatch is sort of leaky so that moist sort of conditioned air is being driven through that cold area and it's condensed and it, now we have a situation where we have mold and mildew or at least the opportunity for it to grow so that's sort of what happens when things don't work out here's another place where that's a tub and typically tubs are full of hot water, warm water, and there's a into the basement where it's cooler. And so what's happened is it was probably a renovation. Well, maybe not. That looks like chipboard there. But they, no one, uh, that's, to, that's to accommodate the trap coming out of the tub, right? And so that's sort of an area where um, you're going to have moisture because you have cold temperatures in the basement and you have warm water in the tub and you have the... Uh, um, possibility of having condensation there so oftentimes those are the sort of things that don't necessarily get air sealed up after the plumber leaves and you know people move into the houses uh, condensation on windows certainly people sort of know about that you know you go into a lot of different houses and you see the evidence of mold or mildew down at the bottom of the windows um, and here's uh, to me that I believe that's a piece of pressure treated plate on a concrete basement and what happened is the moisture got in there and then, then they pull out the insulation and there's the, uh, cave, the sort of perfect environment for mold or mildew to be um, growing. So indoor air quality, and this is sort of what we were talking about, um, when houses move air in and out, a lot of these things that are causing these health problems are moving in and out of the buildings. Um, one of the real big ones is the garage, the attached garage. Um, when in new home construction, we often we often try to discourage people from doing attached garages, either doing a breezeway. I mean, we certainly understand the benefit of not having to go outside um, to get to the car, but um, when you connect the house to the garage, uh, you know the houses. If a house is, um, if you turn on a bath fan, right, the air that you suck out of that fan it needs to be replaced from somewhere, and you don't really know where that air is coming from. And so, if it's being pulled from outside in the garage or from the gra attached garage then it could have all kinds of stuff um, the things that are listed there on the slide and once again the basement we're talking about there's the radon and the mold and the dust and because it's damp and uh, moist down there colder running colder temperatures so you have the um, condensation problems so all these things really affect uh, the building as the way it performs so there's eight principles of healthy homes and lo and behold uh, well, this is what the disease uh, CD, uh, CDC says is we're lo really looking for a coordinated, comprehensive, holistic approach to preventing disease and injuries that result from house-related hazards and deficiencies. So this isn't just indoor air quality per se. When we're talking about healthy homes, it's also safety items, um, tripping, falling, handrails, that sort of things as well. So it's, it's, it's not just um, moisture and indoor air quality. Um, so these are the sort of principles. If you can keep your home dry and clean and safe, and well ventilated, pest free, contaminant free, maintained and thermally controlled, then you're really on the road to having a healthy home. How do you keep a house pest free? 
Well, there are ways to, there are ways to discourage pests, that's for sure. Um, and we're going to stumble onto those. But when we're talking about like mice or that sort of stuff. Oh, that's e but what about flies and, and Asian uh, um, ladybugs? Lady, ladybugs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, the flies, um, yeah. Well, I don't know really what the health hazards are behind flies other than just sort of the mental anguish of seeing them fly all over the place. Um, you're talking about cluster flies, right? Which is sort of not just regular standard house fly. Occasionally, it comes along. There are things called cluster flies. Yes. We must. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I mean, even in the winter, it seems like every night I got a fly here or there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, occasional fly is one thing, right? I mean, they have this thing called a, a, a sort of an organic pest management strategy. If you have, there are certain um, like dust mites and rodents and mice that really can be triggers for asthma and um, you know respiratory things mm -hmm. and that's sort of what this is driving at more so than just the problematic okay. sort of you know fly coming through once in a while or maybe more than that um, but I'll have to think about that um, so once again, if we can keep things dry, and oftentimes there we're really talking about moisture getting to the houses, nooks and crannies and basements or leaking pipes or that sort of stuff. If we can eliminate a lot of the stuff, then we can get to the dust mites in the molds and th that really help to aggravate um, respiratory problems. And so that's sort of what's going on as far as keeping things dry. Um, there's sort of two kinds of moisture that come, bulk moisture that's coming off the outside of the building and oftentimes with proper grading. Sometimes in older houses when water comes off of eaves it creates sort of a swale over 10 or 15 or 20 years and water is just trying to find that path of least resistance. So if it can get to the foundation then it's in the basement as soon as it can get there. And so oftentimes through grading and in new home construction that is really the whole idea is to grade the moisture away from the foundation. So oftentimes these things can be addressed after the, you know, if you just get out there and look around and see what's going on. Um, oftentimes like downspouts and gutters and stuff that oftentimes you're trying to get that water away from and over time things break or things leak. So it's, a lot of it is just maintaining, I mean, coming up with a strategy and then sort of keeping an eye on it over time um, so that it doesn't fail. And so here's like keeping it clean. So part of the way that we can, if you don't necessarily use carpeting, if you keep hard surfaces, it's, it's much better to damp, wipe things. It's not good to sweep things because it just really just moves it into the atmosphere and doesn't really contain it. If you can use vacuums with good filters, HEPA filters and stuff, that's a good strategy. Um, if you can use chemicals that aren't really toxic, certainly, um, vinegar or uh, uh, ammonia. There are some common sort of cleaning um, products that you can use that work effectively. Yeah. Ammonia is, is toxic. So yeah. Well, kind of sometimes you can mix it with water or you can sort of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you just have to be careful with that. That's right. Of yeah. Hydrogen peroxide is another product that people use for different things. Um, so there are, I mean, once again, you know, what, what did my grandmother use, you know, um, 50 years ago? Uh, so that's a strategy as far as keeping things clean. Um, and once again, if you keep things clean, like trash covered or um, uh, th that's what mice are looking for. So with mice, if you can seal up cracks and crevices that you can find, like under sinks is a really good place because pipes and penetrations are, it's dark. There's a lot of stuff in the way. You can't really see what's going on. There's a food source there. Um, so if you can, close up all the nooks, crannies, and cracks, eliminate any sort of food source or water source, then oftentimes you can eliminate a lot of the mice. And mice through, um, you know, their waste and stuff, once again, have a lot of effects on respiratory um, problems, so. I was told rather recently that steel wool yeah. stuffed in the cracks right around the, the pipes that yeah. come up from the basement or whatever. Yeah. Super, super Some people, easy yeah. and so effective. Sometimes they'll use, um, have you ever seen the brass colored steel wool scouring pads? Yes. They'll well, often use it because the steel wool will rust over time. Oh. And so sometimes they'll use that brass product. Yeah. But either way is really, um, yeah. Yeah.
Uh, so once, uh, so keeping it safe, right? And so this guy's putting a little bumper on the bottom of the rug there. Stair runners or culprits. Um, a basement, going down the basement. You know, I go into tons of basement. Very seldom is there a handrail there. Um, and so that would be a really good option because it's dark down there. Typically those stairs are really steep. And there's all kinds of stuff along. I mean, it is really a danger zone when you go down to most basements. Uh, even in showers, you know, handrails and showers, that sort of stuff. These are all just sort of typical safety things that really make a big difference. Um, ventilation is really important. Not just, so this is kitchen ventilation. There are a lot of toxic, or not sort of, there's a lot of stuff that comes off of food when you cook it, frying food in particular. Um, so it's nice to have good ventilation. Um, and even in houses, as we start to tighten them up, then the ventilation even becomes more, more important. Um, there's also ventilation concerns in bathrooms with tub showers or spas. Um, I have a copy of the Residential Energy Building Code in the state of Vermont, and that's what the code says. If you have tub showers or spas, you're required to have a bath fan that ventilates to the outside of the building. And so, uh, once again, those are really moisture management strategies that people um, should be imploring. So when we talk about ventilation, because that's what we were just sort of talking about, this is a study that one of my colleagues did where they put one of those CO uh, carbon dioxide monitors in bedrooms and monitored that um, CO level. And it's sort of interesting because th the 1,000, is that's sort of where you want to be. You don't want to be above that. So I know it's a little bit crazy, all those different colors. And it's sort of weird, up on t below, below where it says CO2 concentrators, there's a color chart. And you'll notice the one at the top left is the blue line, and that's house number one. And if you go over, and then there's another blue line, and then there's another blue. So it's a little bit confusing that there's like five blue lines in here, and they sure all look the same to me. But the gist of this is that, I um, mean, you can sort of see when the doors are open in the bed, these were put in bedrooms, because oftentimes that's where, you know, even in whole house ventilating strategies, they like to deliver fresh air to bedrooms where people are sleeping. And so that's sort of what's behind this study. And you can sort of see on like night one, they had the door open and all of them are down around a thousand. And then night two, they close the door and then they jump right up. And then the door open, they go back down again. Um, and you know, we started looking at this and talking to one of the colleagues who did this. And we said, why is it that some of those, well, it turned out that like that really red line on night two, well, it turns out they had two dogs in their bedroom as well. <laughs> So, so you really have to sort of tease these things around and see what's going on. But uh, so this sort of just sort of this is a test of you know what goes on in people's bedrooms when they're sleeping. So this is sort of ventilation strategies. In the upper right hand corner, that's an exhaust only ventilation. They got a big X through that. That the, the minimum code requirement is an exhaust. Uh, it's called exhaust only ventilation, and the code recognizes that as an improved method. And you have to have an approved bath fan, which means it's low wattage, it's quiet, and that it has the capability to run continuously. So it's continuous duty. And you put it on a programmable timer, and it runs for a certain amount of time, depending upon the needs of the house, how many people live there, that sort of deal. And the downside of that is, is in essence, that fan is pulling air from where it can, wherever it can get it. So it could be from the garage, it could be from the basement, who knows. But really, the, the, the best sort of ventilation is this um, one down to the bottom left. And if you sort of look to the bottom left corner, that's the incoming, that blue line is the incoming fresh air. And it goes in through that sort of narrow room, and there's a box there. And that is the piece of equipment itself. And this is what's known as balanced ventilation. And so it goes into that box, and at that point, it passes by the dark red line which is the outgoing heated stale air. And it preheats the blue line, and then it becomes sort of the, the light red line. And so what's happening there is you're extracting, the dark red uh, line is extracting stale air from the kitchen and the bathroom, and it's delivering the fresh pink air to the bedrooms and stuff. So this is really the cat's pajamas as far as ventilation is concerned. Um, Can that be retrofit? Well, it can. It, it's a tough retrofit because it's hard to get ductwork, but if you can run it through the attic. There are some products. There's a product called Lunos, which is a pair 
of fans. They work in conjunction with one another. I mean, if you think about what a coffee can is, sort of similar to that, it's a core, and then you buy them in pairs, and the way that they work is they, one exhausts while the other supplies, and they run for about 90 seconds, and then they go back the other way, and then 90 seconds later, they go the other way. And they're running at a really low, like 20 CFM, not a really big, huge volume of air. And oftentimes, if you get into, you end up with two or three pairs of them. One of the things about these balanced ventilation system is, is you know, you're, you're forfeiting some energy because you're exhausting this air that you paid to heat. Well, they rate, the, it's called sensible heat recovery, and they can rate the amount of energy that that incoming cold air grabs from the outgoing warm air. And so in our new homes program, we require you to have a piece of equipment that's a minimum 75% sensible heat recovery. So you're, you're gaining back or you're not, you're not gaining it back, you're just, you're not losing it. Yeah, yeah. And there's a whole psychology about how these things get to be set up. One of the downsides, if you don't have one that's gaining a lot of that energy back, is that incoming air is really cold. And if you're dumping that into, I mean, I guess if you're in a bedroom, you just burrow in there and sleep for the night. But if it turns out, oftentimes they bring a, some of this fresh air into living rooms as well, because people are hanging out there. Um, and I've seen systems where, you know, they, they dump it like right over top of the couch, right? And, uh, and they say, well, we don't use that anymore because my husband's freezing every time. And so it's like, wow, that's too bad. They, people have become a lot smarter about the strategies about how to set these things up. But Does someone want to get that? <laughs> no. So once again, the question becomes, how, how well are your own, own homes ventilated? And how do we really know how well they are ventilated um, without doing some sort of testing? And sort of like, what about this room? And I sort of, when I set up my little monitor, I could see that, you know, we were about 800 um, uh, carbon dioxide. And, you know, it wasn't too bad. The relative humidity here was about 35%. And typically, we want to be between 30 and 40. Houses like it a little drier, but humans don't like it so dry. Houses don't like it very moist, but humans need some sort of moisture. Yeah. Is that measuring humidity in here, or yeah, is that something else? Well, the, the one that you can, there's actually two pieces of equipment okay. over there. There's the black one that's measuring particulate matter, and then there's this white screen that's measuring uh, carbon dioxide, relative humidity, and temperature. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so... Why don't you push it up? I can't read it. <laughs> but, Keep breathing, everybody. Well, when we're done, I'll go over there and tell you all what the good news is. Um, and actually, there's some written material over there that maybe you guys... I should have put it over there with the other written material. Um, so we were talking about the pests, right? And this is going to go over that whole idea of keeping it clean and, you know, um, keeping the... If you like, the, one of the things that's really nice, we have one of those things where you, you step on the trash can and the thing opens up, right? And then you throw the stuff in there and then you get off the foot pedal and the thing closes back up again. Those are really good things from this sort of deal because it keeps all the trash stuff really well and the odors and stuff in there because that's what they're looking for is water and food. So um, certainly keeping kitchens cleaned up and food waste put away, that sort of deal helps to control the mice. Um, the contaminant stuff, uh, there's a ton of stuff and we sort of talked about that, different chemicals, volatile organic compounds, gasolines, all benzenes, there's all kinds of stuff out there. If you can sort of keep it out of harm's way, then that's a good thing. I know in our house we have a bulkhead door that goes to the outside to the basement and I have a door there and there's a set of stairs and like underneath there, that's where I sort of try to keep any of the real, so it's really outside, um, it's not inside. Um, yeah. If you uh, well, typically that's sort of, it's not like, if it was a latex paint or something, then I wouldn't be so concerned right. about the chemical side of it. We're really talking about like turpentines and yeah. paint thinners and that sort of stuff. Benzenes and yeah, yeah. Um. So maintenance is really important. That's a filter, a furnace filter. That's their dryer filter. Um, and that's a mini split filter that you're seeing up in the right hand. That's an air source heat pump uh, filter. So it's really important to keep those things clean because that's your first line of protection against all these bad things that we've been sort of talking about. Um, this is sort of a confusing slide. We're talking about, I think what they're sort of saying is they're talking about particulate matter and the size of the particulate matter. And I think what they're sort of saying, like bronchial and pulmonary is sort of, um, the nasal, your nasal capacity to filter stuff 
sort of stops at a certain size and it's the small stuff that you have to be worried about because that's what gets into your lungs and gets into your bloodstream and that sort of stuff. So you, you'll, you'll probably start to hear more about 2.5 is the sort of number that they use sometimes as the particulate matter sort of threshold to be sort of watching out for. So once you get underneath that, that's when things get, get you know, more concerned because then they get into your system. So. Well, the, the chart back a while ago that talked about particulate matter, wood stoves yeah. and fireplaces were way high. Yeah. So what they're so really talking about there the is really the exhaust, really. They're, they're the measuring outside. the, yeah, hopefully to the outside. Now, if that thing's backdrafting, right, or it's not drafting really well, or it's sort of choked up, right, then oftentimes you can sort of see evidence of that. Um, you know, There's sort of, certainly a lot of dust in the house that yeah. burns wood. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a mash Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, the fire, I was just going to say the firewood itself, right, has, it's an organic material that's decomposing, you know, um, so the dust and, yeah. Yeah. Even those little gray uh, moss, see those fly around? That's, they're coming out of the firewood. That, uh -huh. yeah. 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 With things like that, so I understand that like the micro particulates are really bad, but with something like firewood, there's also like, like people, like especially children, but everyone needs to be exposed to dirt and to bacteria in the environment yeah. and stuff like that and yeah. so I you know or else you also get asthma right yeah so like what's the balance there I mean I feel like you you don't want to have particulate matter but you also you don't like yeah. You want to keep your house too clean also, right? Yeah, well, in my mind, so, so there's certain <laughs> things that seem more organic than others. I know that's not the proper term. But like, like to me, benzene, right? I mean, my sense is I don't need to get accustomed to benzene because that is really a bad chemical. But on the other hand, um, mold, I mean, there's probably certain things that, you know, um, it, it, and certain things that don't seem so chemically based that they're going to be like a neurological bad thing for brain development whereas I mean I understand what you're saying kids need to get outside and get some mud and dirt and scratches and you know so that they build up some sort of immunity but I think what we're really talking about here is more like chemical sort of things that are you know inherently yeah, but I mean like bad. the firewood but, thing like I think it's easy to be like oh well, burning wood wood is yeah. organic and then you burn it and it's fine yeah but it's like is the firewood and the dirt that it might bring into the house good but then yeah. The like particulates that might come out of the wood so bad. Yeah. Well, I think the particulate is, is one thing. I, I, to me, if we're talking about things that are like neurological, that's like really the skull and crossbone. That's what we really need to avoid. If we're talking about particulate matter, then, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you go outside and you rototill your garden and you blow your nose, right? And you go, wow, look at all that organic, you know, <laughs> I wish this was back in the raised bed, you know, not in my hanky. So I think some of that is, you know, even particulate matter that's in the house, right? Um, I think what the slide is sort of saying is when you get into the really small stuff, that's when things, you know, get ingested into your system. Yeah, yeah. Right? But I, I certainly agree with your point that, you know, if you're always hitting the hand sanny, right, then you're never going to get exposed to um, some things probably. So. so they estimate about a billion people get their food and light from open fires around the world. And that causes on the order of four to five million deaths just from the air quality yeah. of those things themselves. And talk about the small things, the, the carbon from kerosene lanterns is one of the very worst. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the first upgrades from just candles that governments provide and it's probably a pretty um, poor choice yeah. in terms of human health. Right, yeah. And, and our society, diesel exhaust, is the, mm. the fine particulates that are in diesel exhaust. I'm a runner. If I go by some, you know, somebody who's got diesel exhaust, I mean, I have to cover my mouth because you get, you can feel that going into your lungs and it just, I mean, that fine particulates are really nasty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's sort of what the, if you can smell it, right, then you, you've been exposed, right? Um, but I guess, I mean, I'm not trying to keep everybody awake, you know, from getting to sleep tonight, but, uh, uh. Are all candles, I mean, some people have candles on all the time. Yeah. Are all candles? Um, well, someone else might yes. know more about, I hear, yes. um, beeswax candles, are they any, um, Better, worse, or 
I don't know. Well, they do make some candles now that um, don't put off any. Oh, fake candles. Are you talking about little <laughs> LED well, candles? <laughs> Because we have a bunch no, of those, and I love I'm those things. Of course, that, we have solar, so we can recharge the batteries. But It's sort of a, yeah. a liquid uh, gel, but... Uh, um, still burning stuff. Yeah, yeah, you're still combusting something. Yeah, whale oil or who knows what it is, but... Yeah. Mm. Uh, the, the thing with candles, scented candles, um, if, you, if you're um, being exposed to that scent, it is, in a sense, fooling your nose. Mm, and covering. that scent, um, Yankee Candles, kind of specifically, uh, that is an oil-based product that is uh, accumulating in your nose and fooling your nose and hiding and masking other odor. Um, for a, uh, a school project, I contacted Yankee Candle and asked for material safety data sheets on the products that they're using, and they would not okay. let me. They would not yeah. supply that, no and I, I kind of persisted to the point where the gentleman I was talking to said I would have to get a lawyer Ooh. to get them to release that. So I, I said, but don't you offer that to your employees, the MSDS on? Yeah. And uh, yes, we do, but we don't supply it to customers. Mm -hmm. So it told me that uh, uh, we stopped burning Yankee candles um, after that. Yeah. You should ask them for a list of employees. So you can. <laughs> <laughs> Warning alert. Class action suits coming. Show on Netflix documentary. Uh, so this talks about uh, different sort of filters, MERV filters and stuff. You know, the higher the MERV number, the better the filter will be. Um, are these for filters that you just run in your house? Yeah, filters? yeah, yeah. And you know, like vacuum bags can come in different ratings and stuff. And um, um, even some of the higher end balanced ventilation systems, right, have a, will offer you a higher MERV rating filter for them. Some of these filters have the ability to filter out pollen. So um, it's it's a. Um, is the HEPA factor in is there? Is that a certain? Yeah, yeah, HEPA is, a, yeah, I think that's like MERV 12 or something is considered HEPA, yeah, yeah. Do, do the air purifiers going through those things that, those, you know, like, have a filter on and lower and that sort of thing? Well, I know, like, uh, people who do woodworking shops and stuff to, to get the particulate matter out of there, they are, you know, they load up two or three filters in a row, and for usually the first one is some washable sort of foam thing which catches all the big stuff and you can keep clean. And then there's a MERV filter in there and some of them put one on the back side of things. So then even the outgoing air. So it does collect those things and filter them out of the air. I mean the consumer products that are sold as air, air purifiers. Yeah. You mean the ones that you plug into the wall that smell really good? No, yeah. no, no, not those. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm sure. Yeah. I'm, there are probably ones that are good, and there are probably ones that are hokey. You probably have to sort of, you know, size them up because. Um, and I'm sure that the ones that are good are going to tell you, "Hey, we're good because here's our MERV rate." You know, that's their lead. Yeah. What's a good one that has all three different types of filters in it? What's the name? Yeah. Nickel. They're not cheap. No, they're not cheap, but... Central vacuum cleaners? Uh, well, um, I'm not really sure, you know. There's no filter. I, I wouldn't be... I would think that that would be a market for them. I mean, the idea is sort of good. You don't have to drag a vacuum all over the place. You can plug in here and there. And, you know, I, I see them in new home construction. I haven't really... Um, so this is good because this is sort of the first time I presented this, and this has given me some uh, insight into... Um, different questions that I hadn't thought of. So, yeah. It would be a nice way to fly if you could get a really good filter for that central back deal. Yeah, yeah. We have one, and I, there's no filter that I... I mean, it, the stuff just collects in a big can in the basement. Yeah. You, isn't there a cloth filter or something in the... Well... Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes there's a cloth filter, yeah, which will catch stuff. Where would that be? It's inside oh, your know. central bag. There's, yeah. a, there's a cloth bag in there that ours right. has a cloth bag with a, some sort of weight in the bottom of it and then when we empty that pan I also clean that filter
filter off with a mm -hmm. shop vac yeah. type of thing, so I'm not yeah. getting that back into the environment. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, so this is, you know, sort of, once again, this is, I think what it's really sort of telling you, you need to be in that 12 to 14 range on the MERV rating. So, uh, so this is, this, and, and when I first took this course, there was only seven, and now there's eight things to healthy homes. And what they've done is they say, hey, listen, it's really important to have a thermal, thermally controlled, and what we're really talking about heating, uh, a heated or a cooled, uh, when you get into the extremes, and there's been some studies done in like Ireland and stuff, where when people are in really cold houses, it affects COPD and it affects their respiratory systems. Just the cooler, cooler temperatures. And the other extreme would be in the summertime when it's really, really hot out. Um, I don't know, what was it, several years ago in Europe when they had a heat wave and all kinds of people passed away because they just could not, you know, they couldn't get away from the heat. And so they're really talking about this idea of thermally controlled and they're really talking about having houses that are well insulated because a well insulated house keeps you warm in the winter but it also keeps you cooler in the summertime. And so they're just sort of emphasizing the importance of having good insulation in your homes as far as your health is concerned. And so once again, those are the principles that we were just sort of talking about. Um, and so, uh, how does uh, energy efficiency, you know, where do, uh, so it turns out that when you do upgrades to houses, you not only make houses more comfortable and cost less money to keep heated, um, but you sort of address a lot of these sort of things, chronic asthma, sort of mental stress of people who are uncomfortable, um, being cold all the time. Um, and oftentimes you don't get as sick as much because the indoor air quality is good, so less law, work time loss, less school time loss, that sort of deal. So it's sort of a good mix um, that the efficiency is also a healthy um, benefit as well. Um, and this is one of the, back to those, we were talking about those be, uh, bedrooms where we put the testing equipment in. So this was one, of, on the right hand side was the initial, one of those houses, we moved in one of those balanced ventilation systems. We did the install on it, okay. And so on the right hand side, that's what it was prior to the balanced ventilation. And then on the left hand side, that blue line that you're seeing had dropped them down dramatically. So at one point they were at 3,000 parts per million, which is a pretty big number. Um, and so once again, we dropped that down below the sort of base level of a thousand. And that's what that balanced ventilation sort of system can do for you. So it sort of shows the effect of that. Um, and so once again, if you can make your houses better, right, repair them and fix the holes and air seal them, then you get at those sort of eight things, keeping them pest free, dry, safe. You know, when you insulate, they stay drier and they stay thermally controlled. If you keep them clean, they get rid of the pests and they keep them safe, you know. So it, those eight sort of piggyback on air sealing and insulation and um, home energy upgrades. And so this is sort of the deal. Um, what you know, this is the propaganda. You know, where you improve your comfort, you lower energy bills, healthier spaces, um, healthcare costs. Right now, uh, well, maybe there's a slide in here. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, and so these are the studies that sort of back this up. But although we did have a house over in Chittenden County where once we did all the air sealing and insulation, then all of a sudden we see we saw an increase in radon and formaldehyde. Um, and it was because we, there, there wasn't that balanced ventilation. So one, I mean, you do too good of a job. And <laughs> you well, sort of, that's uh, the thing with it, these modern houses. If you don't do the ventilation, yeah. you're doing yourself trouble. Yeah, yeah. That's a key yeah. Key yeah. But yeah. also in old, old houses that have the wet basement and yeah. you know, there's a certain amount that you can do, but I've always felt like if you, you make those totally tight and all that stuff isn't, you know, kind of flowing through anymore. It's really right. Trapped. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because so I've been doing this about 20 years, and oftentimes people say, "Oh, you guys want us to build houses way too high, too tight," and I say, "Oh, so you want some leaks?" And they, "Well, not really." I say, "Oh, where would you like them? While you're eating your breakfast, or..." So what we say is, listen, let's build these houses as tight as possible and then let's ventilate cool. them correctly. Let's, let's get the ventilation um, and get it out. We know where it's coming from, right? And moisture, odors and stuff. So ventilate them properly. And then that sort of solves the problem. So uh, let's see what we got here. How are we doing for time? Yeah.
So once again, uh, here's Efficiency Vermont, right? We have people, our, our, um, you can call into customer service. We're start, we are, are training uh, Healthy Homes Evaluators. What we're gonna do is move it into, we have a network of contractors um, who are gonna get the sort of same certification that I have to go out and do this in the field. Um, we're working on this air quality loan system where we're gonna loan this sort of equipment to people so they can run it in their houses and see what's going on there. Um, Let's see, uh, and then, then once again, we, we have um, sort of incentives and loan products that help pay for these energy efficiency upgrades. So sometimes that's the avenue to go. Is there any movement in Vermont in trying to get um, some funding from like VHC and that kind of thing for, for um, home, like remediation projects in the, like, well, the, you were at the, the conference that the um, keynote speech there, they're talking about yeah. getting healthcare money to yeah. help yeah. remediate houses, which is then saving the healthcare companies exponential money. Right. Because Right. Not going to hospital as much. Yeah. So there is some activity on that right now. I'm working in this pilot in NBRH in St. Jay. We're looking for ten families. We have uh, we we've, we've done two. We have three more on the hook. So we're still looking for five more. And the, that program, the way that's set up, these would be people who would be eligible for weatherization of the programs from a financial standpoint. We come, we're coming in and we're paying for the ventilation upgrades. And so the, what we do is if we find the pilot home, I go in with all this equipment, set it all up, do the initial indoor air quality testing, get that as the baseline, then weatherization comes in, makes their upgrades, then we come in behind that, do the ventilation install, and then we check the air one more time, and then we watch the medical uh, episodes for a year and sort of see how we're reducing that. So, I it's, mean, still, so it's still in the data collection? Yeah, phase. but there are places in the country where, you know, yeah. I mean, the, the whole idea is at some point the medical or the insurance will write me a, a prescription for uh, indoor air quality and efficiency. So what we're trying to do is uh, leverage um, healthcare money yep. to go towards. Uh, cool. And yeah. so that's still that's yeah. still in. Fair well, it, it, the, 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 it's funny because we're we're sort of on the cutting edge of doing this. We yeah. wrote this pilot, and so we're working with Springfield Hospital as well, trying to work with those guys. And now we're working with UVM, but we're not doing. It's a it's a, it's a different medical thing. It has more to do with mobility and. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of the term right now, but it's not um, respiratory and COPD stuff. It's more mobility and risk, uh, that sort of stuff. Are yeah. you in contact with whoever that, the lady that did the... Well, it turns out the woman that I'm working with in our uh, Laura Caps yeah. is a colleague of those people. Okay, right and on. so they're all, I mean, I, they just sort of brought me in so, right, along, yeah. the, you know, as the sort of field guy. Yeah. And uh, it's been really fascinating. It's been great. Yeah. It's been really... Uh, so we'll see how it goes. Um, and actually, there's a flyer over there that we put together uh, that it has some numbers. I don't know whether you have any friends, community members who might want to come along to this program, but we're still looking for five more people. To, to what five, area? Well, they have to be served by NVRH, which would be St. Johnsbury, that hospital, because we're working with that hospital. As so it doesn't go beyond St. Johnsbury? Not this pilot. You know, hopefully in three years from now, it'll be the whole, you know, in a perfect world, right? But uh, not at this point. Yeah. I know people in Danville. Well, if they go to the Danville Health Center, then Danville does uh, NBRHs because I have visited a couple. We have one client right now in Walden who's coming on board. So if uh, there's a contact number there, I'd be more than happy if we, uh, we could at least talk to them and see what's going on. Yeah. yeah. And is it? Family, what are you looking for? We're looking for, uh, well, so far we've had candidates that are single, family. We're really, the, the baseline is that um, they either have COPD okay. or they have asthma. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So. And so we have contractors, once again, this uh, EEN network are um, people who are certified in this sort of stuff, so we can certainly hook you up with them. Um, this is that pilot at NVRH that we were just sort of talking about. Um, and if you were to get a healthy home assessment, this is sort of an example. Once again, they have the candles right up there in the front, right? So, uh, 
Um, and then once again, when they go in, they'd be looking for, you know, oh, is there food? You know, this is sort of the dirty kitchen and that's where the mice are going to be hanging out. And, you know, that's sort of the mold on the windowsill and the chip paint. And there's the damp mildew in the ceiling. And this is sort of on the outside of the building, right? Where is that downspout going to dump its water? Well, it's going to go right back in the foundation and end up in the basement. So that's sort of an, a brief overview of what those sort of assessments are. And so what we're really trying to do is get the word out, you know, and have people talk about this and, you know, talk to your families and talk to your, you know, healthcare providers and just sort of make people aware of the fact that, um, you know, in your workplaces and stuff that, you know, people are inside and that indoor air quality is something that's really important. So this is a sort of resource of different products out there. Um, healthy home checklist and skin and deep cleaning product databases and stuff. So there are places, resources that you can go to to find out about products. Um, and this is just sort of an idea to get people to sort of take a look, at, you know, think about a little bit of what they might do in their homes or their workplaces and that sort of deal. Um, and this sort of in closing, right, you know, homes affect our health. And so we're really trying to put together this holistic approach um, so that, you know, people will have more healthy homes and they'll, um, if they're healthier, they'll go to the doctor less and then they'll have more resources to do other things with. So, um, it's all about resources, I guess. And so that's sort of it. If there's any questions, this would be a great time or any comments or whatever. Um, I've been doing all the talking, so I apologize. But I want to know what our CO2. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, if we turn the lights on, you guys can go over and take a look at that stuff. Um, but what was it before? I think when I first turned it on, it was in the 700 range. We but haven't been breathing very much. No. Yet. No. We're listening to you. <laughs> well, I put you to sleep anyway, right? <laughs> so. All right. I have a question. Questions? Sure. Yeah. As far as like ventilation <clears throat> crates, mm -hmm. houses. Yeah. Like they, there's like recommendations based on, like the code has recommendations or yeah. levels based on occupancy and building right. size and stuff. Yep. Are those like way over the top or not enough or like do you think they really make good sense from like a practical and health point of view? Well, it's a really hard number to get to because everybody's home is a little bit different. The way the code, the base code reads is it's based on the number of bedrooms because that can reflect occupancy. And what the code says is a minimum of 15 CFM continuous for each bedroom plus 15 for the house. So if you had a three bedroom house, it'd be 15, 30, 45 plus 15 for the house would be 60 CFM continuous, right? It really depends on how many people are. It, so that's, just, that's based on just how many bedrooms, not who's in the house. Um, there's other standards. ASHRAE has a couple different standards that calculate it. Some actually incorporate a blower door score so they can actually tell how leaky the house is and factor that in. You know, the Europeans so, so do... If, you're, if you have a leaky house, your need is less? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, theoretically, yeah. 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 Um, you know, the Europeans do it differently. They, um, they measure the, the VOCs and they measure the carbon dioxide and you tell it what the thresholds are that you want it to trip at. And so they have ventilation systems that run, but they only run in like a recirculating mode until you hit those thresholds and then they go into fresh air mode and then they bring fresh air into the building until you get below those thresholds and then they turn back into recycling. Mm -hmm. And it's a much smarter way and we have some systems like that. So it's a control that uses the actual indoor air quality to drive ventilation. How sensible. Yeah, really, how sensible. <laughs> yeah. But for the most part though, um, it's, it's, hard, it's a hard number to get to because yeah. that's the whole idea behind the testing. You know, from a humidity point of view, oftentimes, you know, if your windows are building up with condensation, then chances are your relative humidity is too high. Um, and so sometimes, you know, people are dialing up that, right? Some sort of fan or some sort of trying to, uh, you know, really, I mean, you take a lot of showers, nobody puts a fan on the shower, you cook a lot. I mean, there's a lot of different factors that add to that load of uh, moisture in a house and stuff. So it's, it's not an easy question to answer, but... That doesn't help That's you why much. It seems like something that actually measures the ambient air might be a reasonable solution. Yeah, it's a no-brainer, right? <laughs> <laughs> actually, they make a little app now for the smartphones yeah. um, that hooks to the bottom of the smartphone that ah. measures that sort of stuff.
Well, thanks. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for letting me come by.